Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii Studios. I'm Andrew, the security guy. And today we've got another exciting episode. I think you'll find this very interesting um, uh, here at Security Matters. Uh, Dr. Joshua Sinai is joining us today, and he is a, a foremost expert in terrorism and counterterrorism. Uh, he teaches, he writes, uh, he's also a consultant. Um, and I, uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about some of the problems with um, that bit of work. I know you probably know what an active shooter is and you know what a terrorist is, but in the researching of um, how, do we, how do we sort of work on those problems, there are some, some issues, and, and Dr. Snyder is very familiar with these. So I think I'm looking forward to this. Uh, Dr. Snyder, thank you so much for taking time to join me today. I, I think this topic is vital, and I think a lot of people really um, – aren't aware. So I'm, I'm looking forward to an enlightening conversation today. You're welcome. Me, um, me too. In, in fact, I, I'd rather be in Hawaii than in uh, Rockville, Maryland. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I get that a lot. Um, so give a, for, for folks in our audience who may not be familiar, maybe give, give your background a little bit, share some of, uh, you know, as much as you care to share, uh, kind of bring them up to speed with um, your work and what you've, what you've been up to lately. Yeah. So, um, I have a doctorate in comparative politics in the Middle East from Columbia University, but when I came to Washington in 84, I switched over to international security and began working on terrorism and counterterrorism issues. And I, I worked a lot on radicalization into um, violent extremism. And then in January 2011, um, when Jared Lochner um, carried out an, an attack against uh, Congresswoman Giffords, everyone started thinking about the, the threat posed by active shooters. And then I began to see that there were a lot of similarities between those who become radicalized into terrorism and those who become, who go on a trajectory in, into violence and becoming active shooters. Mm -hmm. So I began researching that and then I wrote, I published a pocket handbook on active shooter prevention through ASIS International. And then I also, then the, the also the, the problem with the, the insiders, like Edward Snowden, sure. and, uh, Chelsea Manning and, and others. And then I began to realize that, again, a lot of similarities between those who become terrorists, active shooters, and insiders. Many terrorists and active shooters are, in fact, insiders as well. And that many of them also engage in attacks against their fellow co-workers. So then I began to realize that then to put it together, um, a number of us came up with the concept of active threats. Because in okay. many incidents, you have all four of them play out. For example, at Fort Hood, Major Nidal Hassan mm -hmm. was an ideologically driven terrorist. He was also a psychologically driven active shooter. He had all sorts of psychological issues. He was an insider. He was known to his co-workers as someone who was problematic. And then he engaged in workplace violence, work on worker type three. And, and so um, the issue is how, how do you begin to identify such uh, perpetrators during the crucial pre-incident periods? Mm -hmm. when many of the warning signs can be noticed by those around them. So, so I began to um, write about these issues, and I still find that many of these, these issues are not clearly understood by even um, many analysts. Mm. So they tend to look at the, the, the problems in, uh, as silos. So it's only active shooter, only a terrorist, or only workplace violence, rather than seeing that they all come together in many incidents and that by identifying the pre-incident warning observables associated with each type, and then begin to understand that with someone you may, you, you know, may be on a trajectory to carrying out an attack, especially when they are, when, when they decide to acquire weapons out of the blue, you know? Sure. Not, not to become a hunter like Nidal Hassan, when he went to the Guns Galore store in Killeen, Texas, he wasn't there to buy a hunting rifle, but a cop killing gun. So the salesman sure. <laughs> asked himself, why, why is the soldier <laughs> interested right, right. in acquiring um, a Glock, you know, handgun? <laughs> yeah, you would think he could just go to the armory and get something if he needed, right? 
right, right. on base, but then that would right. that, then there would be a record of that. So he was definitely trying to do that um, in secret, you know, right, concealing so that behavior. I, so I think um, that our field can be improved by looking at these um, four disparate threats as, as part of an overall um, active threat category. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I've never seen it. I'm aware of the, you know, the path, the escalation, the violence, you know, that path. Um, but I, I think a lot of people may not know why it's so important. The, the, so if you see something, say something, or, or if someone you know is having a problem or some sort of difficulty that we need to engage because they could become any of those things. Right. You know, that, 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 that first sign is that there's an issue of some type with them and hopefully we can get them psychological help or whatever right. it may be that they need. It might be financial help, but what could propel someone and what they could become, I think a lot of people don't know. And I've never really seen that trajectory like from, from let's just say, disgruntled person to multiple paths. I, I Typically, you see it as an active shooter or as a insider threat, like a thief, you know, someone who steals right. information or, or something. But you don't often see it displayed as a, a uh, I don't know what you would call that, like a category or something. I don't even know how to, how to define that. Right. So, so if HR and security and um, legal had a tool that they could use mm. to map where someone who appears to be troubled might be along, then they could take um, um, mitigative actions. Sure. Uh, you know, refer them to mental health counseling or professional counseling or law enforcement. Mm. And I, I've actually come up with a diagnostic tool that could can be used to oh. map this trajectory. It begins with triggers, there's usually something that, that will trigger them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, personal crisis, professional crisis, ideological crisis. Yeah. Might suddenly become upset, you know, US policy towards yeah. Middle East. Maybe stay at home orders. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, who knows, right? <laughs> right, like Nabil al Hassan was very upset that he was about to be deployed to oh. Afghanistan. But a normal person will usually handle it in a constructive way. Sure. Okay, I'm going through a divorce. I'll, we, we'll, we'll work it out or professional crisis. But if you are psychologically troubled, and that's the second phase, mm -hmm. then you will respond in a negative way. Mm. Then in, in the third phase, you will begin to, it's called, um, you will enter the phase of violent ideation and mm -hmm. fantasy. You will fantasize about taking revenge. Mm -hmm. And even that's normal. Most people, you know, fantasize about sure. taking revenge against people they don't like. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 it will stop at that. Sure. But once you cross the threshold, which is the fourth phase, then it becomes serious, mm -hmm. and you will either then respond um, quickly, or you will take your time in a predatory ways. So some mm -hmm. of these lone active terrorist or active shooters taken like you know six months or a year to, to follow through on, on an attack mm, so once they, they start crossing the threshold then they will start planning an attack you know they'll decide to shoot someone or and then they, they will go through the preparation phase where, where they will begin to acquire weapons mm -hmm. and decide on targeting then they will approach the target and then they will carry out the attack. And throughout these phases, they all leak their intentions, whether in social media or in person. So that's where you can catch them early mm -hmm. on. I see. I see. That's where the see something, say something, you know, comes mm -hmm. in. Do you think we've done a, a good job at, at collecting maybe these um, behavior indicators or because you see you see statistics about the events and the happenings and things like that. But I, I don't think I've come across a, a collection of the, I mean, we see the types of behaviors, but I don't think I've seen them modeled like, um, you know, with someone who buys weapons, for example, is, you know, 60% more likely to become an active shooter or so. I don't, I haven't seen data like that. Is it, is it, is that data out there? Is it, is it available around these, particular people that we know are past cases so that we could 
perhaps look forward to, you know, modeling data that could show us better examples of who could, who has this potential? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. And that's another weakness in the field. Ah, okay. That everyone talks about the need, for example, to um, fight back, you know, do, uh, uh, during an incident. Okay. You know, uh, run, hide, or, or fight. Right, right. And so on and so on. But no one has put together a database of successful preemption during ah. the incident phases. I I've see. tried to, I've, tr I've done some of it. Okay. And I, I've just written an article that has been considered for publication. Okay. In an edited volume in which I present um, 12 cases of successful preemption. Okay. Of the FBI of lone actor terrorists. Good. From, uh, 2000 up to today. Mm. And I think that's one of the first times that someone has attempted to do this. So this is very important. And then, you know, I tried to figure out at what phase, what pre-incident phase were they able to preempt this individual? Mm -hmm. and then, for example, um, entrap them or, 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 and so on. Sure. I've often said yeah. at our at our InfraGuard meetings, it seems like the um, the FBI don't get enough credit for all the good work that they do. Right. A lot of their their stuff, it never comes out all the things that they stop. Right. So, for example, out of about 55 cases of lone act of terrorism since 9-11 uh, that I've come up with, um, at least about 12 of them were successfully preempted. Awesome. So and, the, the, the goal is to increase the, the rate of, pre, of successful preemption. Sure. Uh, and you do that by providing law enforcement and others with the tools and the information they need to, uh, to, to know how to track someone. Was the public involved in, in the first identification of these individuals or was it uh, in, what, in the ones that you studied, was it... Um, Law enforcement actually intervened because they learned something else, learned a weapons purchase or something like that, other than like a hot tip from a, a, a friend or a co-worker or something like that. Yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a mix. So you have uh, those who are associated with these individuals mm. um, informing the FBI and, and others about them. Okay. Yeah, so that, that does give some validation to bringing, you know, we teach, you know, our, our staff, we teach everyone to look out for your neighbor, you know, and there's a reason why we should be looking out. And if your neighbor's not getting the help they need, you need to bring that to someone's attention. Yes. Oh, and, and after Nidal Hassan had successfully purchased his Glock handgun at Guns Galore, the next time someone tried to do that who appeared suspicious, I think his name was a private uh, Nasser Abdo, this time the salesman did contact the FBI. Oh. Who then arrested good. him. Wow, good. So yeah, and so, was he was he so he was down heading down a path to extremism yes. or to violence? Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Wow. Interesting. Um are these um how do you feel we're doing with the, the profiling of looking? Because you know, early on, just to calling someone an insider threat, they have a variety of, of sort of options to how they're gonna act out. Um is the uh, you know, what differentiates or is it known, you know, what differentiates someone who, who just becomes like an active shooter of their workplace or someone who becomes an active shooter publicly, you know, that goes out to a mall or to a school or someone who um, acts out, you know, maybe religiously like the guy. I know there was the kid that attack, attacked the um, uh, mosque, I think, in uh, Atlanta or something. So yes. are these prof Is there enough data to, to build profiles around where these folks may be headed? Um. Yes. So, so, so well, once again, you can apply the diagnostic tool that, that I, I, I have developed, which actually is based on the work of others. Okay. All I do is just take it to the nth degree. Awesome. Good. Um, well, thanks. Thank you, Fred. I, I think uh, we may have to have a whole episode on that. Uh, right now, let's take a, uh, we're going to take a short break for about one minute. We're going to pay some bills and we'll be back right back with um, um, our, our show. Thank you. Okay. Aloha, I'm Krista Stadler, the host of Nonprofits Mean Business 2 on ThinkTech Hawaii. Nonprofits Mean Business 2 investigates the operational challenges and costs related to managing nonprofit organizations. 
while encouraging our viewers to find a nonprofit organization that you're passionate about in our community. We are streamed live on Think Tech Hawaii bi-weekly at 12 p.m. on Thursdays. Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. Mahalo. Hey, aloha, and welcome back to Security Matters. Today, we're talking with Dr. Joshua Sinai uh, about sort of some of the issues around defining, you know, what an active shooter is, what an insider threat is, some of the difficulties with the academia, some of the difficulties with sharing data and information and really indicators of, of that threat tra trajectory itself. Um, Dr. Sinai, thanks again so much for joining us today. I know that um, you teach um, terrorism and counterterrorism in, in, uh, in the university system. Um, are these are the um, are the mechanisms for discussing this 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 narrative about uh, how to counter you know how to um, intercede you know with someone who's on this path to violence are, are these narratives available I mean social media has been condemned for promoting you know uh, these um, uh, violent extremists you know in in the United States and, and other places in the that they've built a good narrative around recruiting. Have we built a good counter narrative to that? I, I don't see much of it out there. Right, well, one, one of the problems is that um, for, for counterterrorism to be effective, it has to um, combine a number of different measures. One is coercion, you know, military, uh, diplomatic, economic, and it's, intelligence, police, and so on, and a conciliatory in which you um, attempt to resolve the underlying causes that, driving, that, that drive an insurgency. And, 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 and I see the threats as insurgencies. Okay. They don't just emerge out of the blue. There, there are problem areas that, that, that drive them. And unless you resolve them, it's, it's very difficult to defeat an, an insurgency um, only through military measures, although th those, those are necessary, but, but you have to resolve the underlying causes that drive them. And, and one measure is to come up with a counter narrative mm -hmm. because the ideologies that drive such individuals, you know, promise them, you know, uh, all sorts of attractive solutions to their lives. You know, they, they, they will become heroes for the cause, mm -hmm. uh, martyrs, you know, and so on and so on. But how, how do you counter that, especially in the West? So a lot of academics have come up with methodologies to um, formulate counter narratives, but they don't actually come up with the content for them. Oh, so, so, so we know how to do it, but we don't right. have the, I see. Well, that's saying, interesting. There's a need to do it. Here's the methodology to do it, but there's no content. Mm. Sure. Is it? Is it? Does it have to? Is it because it has to counter like a psychological appeal? Is that the uh, you know that this counter narrative may not be known to a person who isn't drawn to the uh, to the insurgency narrative you know what i mean how would you it's an interesting dilemma right because um there are lots of problems that you know drive these individuals to become violent extremists but there are also a lot of problems in society so those problem areas need to be resolved to begin with mm. how do you provide them an attractive counter narrative without resolving the problems that 
um, motivate them. But that's, but that's one problem. Another one is that no one has really come up with metrics of effectiveness ah. to assess the effectiveness of these counter-narrative campaigns. Hmm. Yeah, you know, we've only seen, it seems, and again, I, the data I think comes uh, primarily from the FBI, but the, it seems that we just see more and more. So what people see in the media is that these incidents are on the rise. But we don't really know if that's true because we don't know how many have been stopped. We don't know where perhaps a um, someone that was considering something decided not to do it because they read a poster or because right. they got some help. So we we really don't know that they're rising, but we know that you know the media you know makes its money off of maybe promoting a bit of fear or something like that. I don't know if it's intentional or not, but they're promoting the data that we have. Yeah. So one one of the problems is that, and, and actually this is why I find the response to the current um, COVID-19 pandemic very interesting because public health officials have come up with metrics to assess effectiveness in um, reducing uh, the number of infections and fatalities. For example, they've come up with what they call the, I think the, the R curve, mm -hmm. the, the rate of infection. R so not, yeah. If it's below, if it's above one, then it's not effective. If it's below one, then it is effective. So something like that should be applied to um, counterterrorism and also to countering violent extremism as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would think um, there would be some more, uh, I, and I don't know that there's not, but a, a more effort expended in that area, right? A, a program of um, sort of like counter recruitment. I know they, you know, social media has been picked on a bit for having, you know, trend, they want them to take down this content that exists in a, in a country that, you know, champions freedom of speech and things like that. I realize that's a bit problematic, but I sure don't see, just to my knowledge, where the, this, there's a lot of discussion around uh, retraining or, or uh, maybe, uh, would it be a, an information campaign to, you know, where, where people can get help if they're considering ideas like that. I just, I don't see much of that kind of stuff out there. Right, so th that's why I, I once wrote an article about um, in, in which I presented a model to assess the effectiveness in countering violent extremism, and I used the British um, counterterrorism campaign in Northern Ireland as a um, case of best practice. Okay, because they were able to resolve it. Yeah, so it's so it's doable. That's interesting. Right. There's a there's a known model out there. Sure, that's awesome. Right. Well, they were also able to do it because the IRA had a very effective political front in Sinn Fein, and um, its leaders were very effective. Yeah. And it's, unfortunately, other terrorist groups don't have as capable um, leaders as, as Sinn Fein. So, and also another problem is. Um, what is the population that you are dealing with? Mm. So, so in, in the case of um, Britain, I tried to figure out um, how to assess the effectiveness in, in the campaign by coming up with um, the number of violent extremists in Britain that needed to be uh, counted. Okay. So let's say th th there are um, three million Muslims in Britain, of those, let's say 10% hold extremist beliefs that are nonviolent. Among them, let's say another 10% are violent extremists. And let's say 5% of those are actual, uh, those who are planning an attack. Okay. So, so you need to direct a campaign at the um, community of violent extremists. Sure. Let's say there are 10,000 of those. So if, if, you, if, if you've implemented a campaign to go after them, then what is your success rate? Sure. You know, how many of them are you able to persuade, to turn away from violent extremism and, and, and just, I mean, specifically right to, have to extremist 
hold extremist beliefs in a democracy. That, that's perfectly legitimate. Sure. So to assess the effectiveness of a campaign, you have let's come up with the numbers. Okay. Yeah. Real something it's that's real. Numbers, just like you know, countering a pandemic. It's all about sure. numbers. Uh huh. Yeah, and you this you would think that, done in oh, the field. Yeah, you would think that everybody everybody sees the one right, the the yes. one active person, but. A, uh, a successful program obviously would stop, of course, hopefully the one, but you're probably always going to have the one. The, the trick is to stop the other 909, the other 9,999. Right. 9, right. That would be a very effective program. Right. And maybe, so I've maybe. Never seen, I've never seen an article <laughs> oh. that has come up with uh, such a figure. Ah, interesting. Well, that sounds, sounds like there's a lot of work to be done in that field. I, I, um, I, I'm glad that you're working on it. I'm, I, we need more people working on it, I believe. Uh, we've got a, a minute or minute and a half left. Um, if you'd like to leave some uh, maybe closing thoughts for the audience, uh, some things to think about out there from, from your research or from um, maybe some of the things you've been teaching recently to the students. Yeah, so I think one, one thing is the need um, to come up with models that everyone can use in the field that are um, user-friendly and that can be used as tools in um, everyday work for the operational community. There's one problem with academia is that some academics only talk to other academics. Okay. Providing methodologies and tools that the operational community can use, law enforcement, intelligence, and so on. Mm -hmm. so that, that's one, one weakness in, in, in the field that, that needs to be addressed, but that I've tried to do in my own work. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that work. Um, and for, the, for our viewers out there, remember, you know, be, be, your, be your brother's keeper. If somebody's struggling with something, try to get them some help before they, you know, end up down this pathway and they're irrecoverable. You never know what somebody's capable of doing out there these days. Um, Dr. Sinai, I really appreciate you taking time to join us today. I think um, our audience is, is better off for having understood some of these problems that exist in the, in the academic world and in the research world and in the real world uh, surrounding, you know, active, active threats. Um, and I'll, I'll look forward to um, seeing more of your work in the future. Thanks. And, and actually, um, well, in the process of preparing for this program, you know, I put together some of my thoughts and I'm going to publish an article about it. So I'll send it to you so that you can then forward it to your, to your listeners. Yeah, we'll link it to this. Uh, this video will be public. The recording will be published a little bit later today or tomorrow, and I'll link that to the, that recording as well. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Sinai. Have a great day. Aloha. You too. you too. Bye.